super happy to join you guys. I'm just going to jump directly in the subject and share my screen. And we're going to talk a bit about, unfortunately, a bit about myself for you, then about art, which is going to interest you. And then we'll go into art stream and you'll be uh, able to ask all your questions. And that's going to be the most important part, right? So do you all see my screen? Or only you see my beautiful little head. Yep. Let's go then. So hi everyone, and let's gonna we're gonna start on our draw break session with uh, with was actually me, right? Yeah, me, the fat bearded guy that's gonna talk to you right now. So what we're going to talk today? The first question you're going to be asking yourself is who is this guy, right? So basically, I'm an art director working in the video games. I was before that a concept artist, but also an illustrator. All those two into a freelance activity. It's been now more than 10 years that I'm in the video game industry. Actually, now we're getting closer and closer to 13, which is not getting me any younger. And the most important thing about myself, I love pepperoni pizza. So if you want to bribe me, you know what to do. To give you just a little, uh, let's say, career path in education. So I had my uh, bachelor in in um, in 2005, which I can assure you they were not dinosaurs at this moment, but it was close to. I went after into a one year of uh what we call a preparatory school in French, which is uh, giving you, you know, high, high level arts uh, in very different domains. And then you prepare the exams to get into, uh, let's say the, the high study schools. And my, the school I made was Superfocum, what was a 3D uh, art school. Uh, that gives you, you know, a diploma of a director, uh, director of three D movies, and from this I went uh, into uh, yeah a career of video games. So my career started as a cinematic artist, actually. So you know, I was not directly into do, to the art, but during my period at uh, on, as a cinematic artist, I shifted to go to concept art. And the more I was working in this field, I evolved to level to lead the artist, sorry. And in parallel, I was always doing my freelance activity of uh, illustration for books or concept arts, uh, uh, tabletop RPGs, etc. All this, you know, fed what I became today, an art director. I'm going to show you just a few of my artworks, um, I will say the most famous in my non-famous uh, career. <clears throat> I have a very, you know, uh, broad style of, let's say, from dragons to knights by skeletons and uh, and anything that's more or less dark fantasy. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Vampires and monsters and creatures with sometimes a very ge geometric style. That's where I have been recognized the most, but this is my personal art uh, to say. A few years ago, I was the my first art director job was on the game Other Side. There was a black and white with a touch of red, uh, dark tactical fantasy game. <clears> that was uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, an independent game, so the much smaller reach than the game I've been working in that launched. Uh, recently, that's Lord of the Fallen, that maybe you heard about, that this one is an action RPG game in a full big 3D and all platforms. And it was my big work uh, as an art, fresh art director, where you can see here some of the first moods that I created for this game. And of course, you know, there was the whole process up to get to the, the final looks of the game. Uh, Lords of Fallen have this distinct uh, particularity to be a Souls-like, but that has a dual dual realm, two worlds that are merged in, uh, together, and that allowed a lot, a lot, a lot of cool designs and fantasies. 
And here are some of the last pieces I made for the game. You know, the whole process of creating a game is very long and you can start from the sketches up to the biggest uh, artworks. All of this you can find on my art station. My job is done. I did my, my uh, <coughs> auto promotion. Now I can just leave. Of course not. Let's go back to serial. So just before we go into painting, I'm going to show you a little part of how I think and how I uh, treat with art. And so this, you know, starts about what is a 2D artist. Of course, <clears throat> the biggest idea about it is that we are the ones that are, you know, bringing visuals to ideas. Every, it's not necessarily your ideas. It's not necessarily mine. But that's our job is to give... Um, a sense of reality to stuff that are absolutely uh, conceptual. And that's very serious, yes. So who are the 2D artists? Of course, we're a whole bunch. Of course, most of you probably are aspiring to become a concept artist or 3D artist, but there is a lot of stuff, you know, illustrator, art director, but it touches a lot of things. You can work on environments, character designs, be a 2D graphist, be some, do some UI or markets, or even being a storyboarder. A lot of things covers the 2D art, but <clears throat> from the beginning of our journey, from uh, let's say the whole production, we're at the beginning of a long journey together, we're creating an art, but we have like a main focus goal. It's the preparation up to the production and us, we are more or less involved at any point in it. Of course, a bit more creatively in the preparation, but up to the end of the production, we are here. So what does a 2D artist do? He take an idea of someone, he feel what is needed by this people or this brief or this uh, creative director or this mission of a freelancer. He does a research and exploration, and then he concretize all of this. And then of course we deliver. So let's take, you know, just a basic idea. Let's say uh, someone is going to come and ask you to say, I want a knight with big muscles. He's dark and swift. He's original, but still a bit mainstream, sexy, but not too much. Or maybe a woman, or or maybe not. This is a typical brief, right? That's the part where you're going to have to feel what's really needed from the person that's asking to you. This can be a very general idea. It's not necessarily just, you know, a mission or a brief that you can have. This is everything that's going to happen. Up to me being an art director, I still have those kind of analysis to do. So let's say what I feel is that most important is the night, dark and swift, and maybe sexy. I start like doing the first explorations and researches. It can be a lot of exploring and researches. Iteration is some part of the the process that makes that you can find and you create new ideas. Ideas comes to everybody, it's for free, but finding the good ones, that's the hard part. You concretize by finally, okay, those are the elements of design I want to keep. Those are the small elements of design that I want to take off or change. And at the end, you deliver. All this, I guess, you're starting to know what you know already. But so what's, let's say, the common things that we all have together, that I have, that you have as students, and <clears throat> that Oscar have, that we all share. So we have a kind of common language, right? We have what I would call artist tools. Those tools are the hand, the brain. Well, in my case, it's a very small tool, but it's still a tool, and the eye. The hand is basically your art technique from traditional to digital, it's not that much important. For my part, I come from a very traditional uh, background. I was doing paintings and, uh, let me say, uh, pencils and uh, ink, etc. Before getting into digital, then my work pushed me to continue in digital. And of course, and probably you heard that thousands of thousands of times, but everything is about training. So doing again and again, again and again and working again and again. Of course, you you always you know come from somewhere. So if this this piece that I show I made in a few years ago is much more advanced technically than my very first digital art that you see here on the right side. 
in between, I guess there is something like 10-ish years that are separated. And of course, the technique has evolved, but not th only this, right? The second thing is the brain. The brain is what's going to bring your creativity, your understanding of stuff, not necessarily only on function, but as we said for the brief, on what people want or emotionally what they need. And it's going to help you uh, when you train it, finding the solutions for the other. So for example, here, you have the one of the very first piece that I did for other side of the game. So you can already see some stuff uh, about the design, some, uh, let's say, almost black and white tones, yellow eyes, white hair, long scarves, a nice looking girl, and let's say haute couture uh, outfits. Three years later, that's the main cover of the game. And you can see the same elements that have been kept from the beginning to the end. It's because the systems that you train with your brain, uh, once you nailed them, that's the thing that's going to make the essence of the creation you're doing. It's the same actually for Lords of the Fallen. This is the very first concept I made for the Dark Crusader Isaac that you showcase that we showcased in the in the ads in the trailers and everything and a lot of the elements in this are what are part of the art direction during the entire game spikes uh gothic feeling rust on the armors shredded uh cloaks high level symbolisms uh very churchy vibe right and of course in the end of the game and now that the game has launched almost three years later, there are some of those elements that stayed, some chance transformed, but most of it is still here. And the eye. So the eye is one of the most important thing. It's also one of the hardest to train. It's basically setting the quality that you are looking for, but also your way of apprehending designs, shapes, and elements when you're trying to work. And uh, most of it comes with experience. It's something that's very difficult, uh, especially when you're young, and I was young a very long time ago. Yeah, I can assure you, I was young. Um, it's something that's difficult to understand that sometimes stuff is going to take just time. It's the number of stuff that you're going to see. It's the experience you're going to live that's going to train your eye. But your eye is going to become one of your most important tool especially when you're going to be an art director. So let me, though this is a bit quite exclusive, it's just for you guys. It's uh, some of the uh, preparatory sketches that we made with Fred Rambo, who is one of our concept artists on uh, Lord of the Fallen, for one of our main characters, who is named Pieta. So before this, I give him, you know, a whole a brief about all the elements that we need, lore-wise, aesthetically-wise, etc. But it's only words, right? So this is the first step where he gives me three sketches. From those sketches, I mash them up, I uh, duplicate, create, change, paint over it, add all my comments that are necessary. This is where my eye works in more than my hand, because as you can see, the modifications I did are not technically that complicated. But what's important is how my eye kept the elements that I needed. This brings us to a more advanced version where still there are details that are needed to be changed. Small ones, some who are, I know are going to be important for the 3D, some that I know are going to be important for um, the, the lighting or the animation, etc. On another type of character, the um, this was for the Lamp Reaper. It's a very badass boss that we have in the game with, with the huge smile. You can see it in some of our trailers. So same here. I had a brief that I gave what kind of weapons he had, what kind of style I wanted. But you can see that there is a further step where I transformed a lot on the sketch uh, to get some elements that were be or what I consider more unique. For example, this very distinctible shape for the helmet or the color that's a bit calling back to the Green Goblin in, uh, in Spider-Man or the Joker in Batman. And even on an advanced uh, painting, I am still trying to refine every little small aspect 
<laughs> of the um, of the design, extending a little bit the smile, adding some elements here and there, adding what's gonna move when you're gonna see the character in animation, etc. And then we get to the final steps, and even there I can push for an extra step. I don't know for an evolution of the character or pushing a very particular um, emotion. All of this is possible because of the eye. So the hand, the brain, and the eye, all of those work in synergy, right? One of my uh, teachers, when I <clears throat> when I was um, a student, as like you, said that one of the most important thing was to create the shortest uh, shortest road from your brain to your hand. The shortest the shortest it is, the more easily you can communicate what you see with your eye into your brain and on your hand. Mm, yes, it's perfect. So let's just, uh, I'm going to show you just a very quick example of one of my pieces. Um, what I do usually is I use very strong ge geometric forms because it's something, it was an exercise that I always loved. In this very strong form, I can create a very easily some composition, and then it's going to be design that's going to take place. Design of the shapes, and then it's more or less sculpting inside of those shapes, adding the good amount of details, and then refining the whole piece, which gives us this. I hope you're inspired by all that I said right now. And now that I spoke a lot, lot, I propose that we go into a live stream uh, part where I'm gonna, gonna start uh, painting and I'll be able to take your questions at any time. So let me just, you know, use what it has to be used. It's called Photoshop. So since I'm super lazy, the thing I ask, I ask my son that's four years old to do a first, you know, sketch. Uh, as you can see, uh, talent and skill is not really genetics. So <laughs> we can now uh, go and jump into this beautiful uh, drawing from my son. And I'm going to start, you know, uh, searching for designs, shapes inside of it while we are speaking. It's a technique that I like because it allows me to not to put my brain a bit on off and being a bit more automatic. And so I can, you know, answer your questions freely more than, you know, doing a deep, um, deep questioning and a brief of exactly what I need and what I want. So probably do a little mental image of the, um, a beautiful sketch of my son and uh, try to see where I can find some shapes and stuff and we'll see if at the end result we have something a bit similar. So for now I'm going to start really super simple what I need is to get, first of all, you know, first glimpses of what's going to be my idea and let's say the main composition. Composition is probably the most important thing for me into when I'm creating a painting and to the arts because, um, well, actually, even naturally, just the fact of working into a canvas, so putting your work into a square or a rectangle and stuff, it's already creating you know, a window. So you're already creating a composition. So that's why composition for me is one of the most important things that I ever learned and I train myself to. And uh, because composition is like how you assemble shapes together and how they uh, harmoniously work one with another or not work one in another. And that's where you can, you know, start creating images in your head, but also in the head of the people who are watching. So that's for me the most important. I'm going to start finding a basic start of a shape and uh, refining the more and more, at least the, let's say the high level shapes and the silhouettes. And then we can go maybe in more details, even if, you know, it's sometimes a long process. So you'll just see the beginning of a. And so if you have any questions, just just go and shoot. I'm I'm ready. I'm I'm I was born ready.
as you can see, I don't need you don't no need to be shy. I am just one more fat bearded guy in your life. And we have a lot of common grounds. We all paint and we are all create. So there are no bad questions. So here you see I'm I'm starting to find let's say my first silhouettes and shapes. Let me show you what I'm seeing for now. If I take look, let's take a very beautiful color. Pink. So I saw a kind of arm here that started and a broken neck and here probably a kind of a head. And so that's the overall silhouette I'm going to start to work with. I'm just going to respect the colors for now of my son because he likes bright colors. Very surely I'll have to tone them down at some point because, you know, I'm a dark, edgy guy. Hello, I arrived a little late, but I would like to ask you, was, what do you consider was your biggest success in your career? Uh, in my career, because I was going to say my biggest success are my kids, because ah. you know, that was super hard. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and it's still super hard. But yeah, no, uh, success in my career. Well, I had very, from, you know, a very long time, I was set, setting a few goals, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in, my, in my life and career. So I had some that were like, uh, I would really like to work for Warhammer one day. And that was done. And I would really like to work for Magic the Gathering one day. That was done. And so I'm like ticking things. Then I really want to be an art director. So this one, I'm most happy it's it's done. I would like to do a very meaningful game for me. I did it with other side. I would like to do a game that is, uh, you know, financial success. Uh, I hope it will be with Lord of the Fallen. Some of the goals that I still have uh, are like, I would like to do a, a character someday that becomes, you know, a bit iconic. For example, you know, Pyramid Head in Silent Hill 2 is an mm -hmm. iconic monster. So this, these are some of the things I still have on my list. But yeah, on biggest uh, career success, I'm very proud of Other Side and Lords of the Fallen. Just because it's also my two first art director roles and... Uh, and, you know, uh, we have to still be a, a bit proud of what we're doing at some point. Mm -hmm. And I hope uh, I'll, be, I'll be able to do even more and even more. Oh, how exciting. Yep. Uh, salut, bonjour. Uh, mon français n'est pas parfait, ça Et j'aimerais vous demander quel avenir vous jouez vous pour l'intelligence artificielle et l'air. Et merci beaucoup pour l'attention. Vos dessins sont magnifiques. Oh là là. Uh, so having this in French, it's like my heart is pounding. Thank you so much. <laughs> so what are my thoughts on AI, right? That's the, the, the what you ask, right? So mm -hmm. my thoughts on AI. I, I was scared at first, I would say, because it was something where you know, it's a bit like when you're a guy from a medieval time and somebody shows you a, a screen and you're like, this looks like magic. I can't understand. It looks like magic. Then uh, there is, let's say, two or three parts that goes with this. First part is, is AI going to take my job? And this is the thing where I'm, I guess a lot of us can be scared, right? I think I am in a good position where now that I shifted from, let's say, a less skill-driven work, like pure concept art, to art direction, where I less have to use my hand, but more my brain and my eye, I'm in a better position than when I was, you know, focusing 100% on my skills. I think that AI could could become one day a uh, excellent tool because it's more or less this a tool and when you give it in good hands tools are always good if you give it in bad hands well 
You have people who are going to say artist doesn't count anymore. It's better to not use an artist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I would say it's going to be a bit depending on all of us, right? Not just us, the artists, and how do we resist to AI or not, but also the people who are hiring us and how do we they consider it. So this would be, let's say, the first part. I think that I won't use AI right now, and I wouldn't for a second reason I'll come back to, but someday it probably will be a good assistance. Why I'm saying this? Imagine that if you're doing some 3D, there are still some stuff that you're doing in 3D that are absolutely not helping your creativity, like deploying UVs or doing the retopology of your character. Those things are just boring and can be done with a lot of skill, but could be totally automatized without losing your creativity. These are things where I think the AI could help. Finding a reference, like I need 20, you know. That is a fashion uh, is caprichoso. Oh. Sorry, I didn't hear, I don't understand this, but whatever. Um, but the second part is how is the AI uh, working? So this is more complicated, especially for me who has a small brain. The big problem these days is that uh, the AI is not respecting copyrights or the creator they are generated of. And this is what's the most problematic. For example, me, even if I was wanting to put and use AI, I don't know, to help me generate the 100 weapons that we have into Lord of the Fallen, it would not be that possible because I can't be sure that anything that's created with my AI is not actually stolen from somebody else or a style of somebody else, etc. So for me, AI is not a suitable tool for now, but doesn't mean it will be not suitable for the future. And final point, and then I guess I'll, I'll stop on this subject for now, unless if you have other questions. <clears throat> I had, since the, let's say, AI started to boom a little and started to flourish a bit everywhere, um, I had a lot of students coming, actually like you did, asking what I think about AI and what uh, is, is it even worth it for them to continue in this field where somebody with a few clicks can get what is going to take us hours to succeed, right? And for those people, I would say, if you think of the three tools I gave you, there is one or two of them that nobody, absolutely nobody, even an AI can't get. The eye at first, but also the brain. And why I'm saying this, what's the important thing of making and creating? It's not to have only the end result, right? When you're creating something, you're putting a, part, a piece of yourself a bit of your soul inside of it. And when you're doing so, you're hoping that the way you did it is going to resonate with somebody else, someone who is going to see your piece of art or who is going to read your book or who is going to watch your movie. And this resonance between what you lived when you were a kid, what you watched when you were a teenager, what you experienced for the first time you were in love, with your kids when they were born and you saw a replica of yourself, all of this an AI can't understand because they are, AI is just an accumulation of stuff that we all had as humans. So when you think of all this, I think that we are not that replaceable and that uh, there are benefits of using real humans that an AI can't succeed to obtain or at least not for now. That's it. I know it looks like a very bad philosophy, but <laughs> at least it's a part of it. Oh, so cool the information. Me merci. Je suis d'accord. Ah bah tant mieux. <laughs> C'est le mieux. Okay, so now we're starting to have something that looks like a character. 
And how do you keep the balance between your work and your regular life? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I think uh, at first I was not. <laughs> so when I was young, I don't know how old you all are in the in those courses, but me when I was young, I was clearly not uh, respecting anything of my um, of my personal life versus work life, meaning that um, I had like a thirst of of working. And uh, that's why I had a job, but also my freelance activity for evenings and um, and weekends. I have a very comprehensive wife that actually helps a lot to get you know a balance. Uh, and more or less everything changes when you have your first kid, and you know you have to change stuff in your life, and even more when you get the second one, and. Uh, some of the things that brought me back to thinking, I had like uh, very bad health issues due to too much work. Uh, so back, you know, back spine problems. It happened to me first time at the end of my studies. So when I was, let's say, relatively young at 24, 25 years old, and I needed an operation for this, a surgery. And I had exactly the same thing that happened exactly uh, 10 years later, where I had to go back in surgery. And that's where I started to, let's say, give a better balance into my uh, work and life. It also came when I started to focus more on art directing rather than pure uh, paintings. Why that? Because paintings is a little bit, you have to train, you know, and get better and better for your hand. And uh, when you're doing art direction, it's a bit more about the brain. And when it's about the brain, you understand at some point that let's say anything you're doing in life, art, uh, I don't know, art or uh, watching a movie, going out with friends, this watching the the moon outside, everything is, is basically adding things into your visual li library, giving you ideas. And so, at some point, I had like a understanding or revelation, even I could say, that it's it's okay for me not to be always working. I'm not going to be left behind. I'm just going to get, you know, more ideas, more stuff for me, <clears throat> more thoughts, and that was perfect. So now I, you know, I fix my hours. Well, not today because I'm here with you, but. Other days, I fix my hours. I don't work more. I take my time to do other stuff than uh, than working. Well, it doesn't mean that I stop doing art. For example, my weekends, I always have a time where I do oil paintings in my little bar backyard. So it's always a bit related. Sometimes, you know, I'm going to go and write stuff. Sometimes I'm going to think or watch a movie, but analyze it into a way that could be helpful for my work. But at least I'm not like focusing on painting, painting and using my hand every five minutes. And this is what creates the biggest difference in my life balance. That's all. That's all I got. Thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. Yes, hi. Um, thank you. Um, well, um, I understand that um, as artists, we don't talk a lot about money. But as I am looking for work, <laughs> so I began with interviews and all, all of that. But when I am presented with um, um, they they ask me, oh, what are your ways for this concept, uh, mm -hmm. concept work or something like that? I don't know if I am telling them something very low or too high. I don't don't know what what are the the common ways in the industry because I'm just uh, beginning on that. No, I I have been freelancer. Yeah. So I don't have ideas, and well, it's um, different to work with a private client and for a company, and the 
times are very different. So um, I don't know how do you began to um, um, have a better understanding about that. Uh, how do you knew what were proper ways uh, used way wage? Yeah. So I am gonna be the worst example <laughs> master for you on this. So let me explain why. So first thing, um, so me, I, I had the, the luxury and happiness to be hired directly when I, I stopped my school. Uh, so when I finished my course, I was hired as a cinematic artist. And then I started my freelance um, activity, but knowing that I had a salary uh, on the side that was not very high, but still I had money. Um, I didn't care that much about my rates because I could, you know, have a living even without it. So it helped me, let's say, build my freelance career and path without taking too much money in account. Secondly, the uh, I am really a bad example because as I'm talking with all my friends. I am the worst at negotiating my rates because I'm always lowering in them down, saying, ah, maybe I'm not worth it or maybe I'm not the, that good. Ah, come on, I can do it very quickly. And I am a kind of fast painter. So if I use like a hour rate, I'm, I'm always going to be underpaid <laughs> compared to some of my peers. And on the salary part, the thing is that I never negotiated any any time my salary and it's the people I'm working with are saying, oh, you deserve more and they give me just more money. So I'm a very, very bad example for rating. What I would say, it's very, very rare that you're so much out of the of the the ratings and wages that the company or the people um expect that they're going to say it's really too high i can't take this person especially if you're a beginner so the best thing i could say is test so you're you're getting a proposal we're asking you what are your wages you give the honest answer of i think i'm worth more or less this if they say yes directly Maybe you were a little bit low, but at least it's what you wanted, right? Or it was enough for you, so it's okay. If they're saying, it's more than we expected, what's probably going to happen? Then you have to see your balance of life. <clears throat> Do you need this money? Do you need more of, the, of money? Is it possible that you still take the job because it's going to help you for your career, etc., etc.? The one thing that's not possible, except if you have another job or other incomes of money, is accept accepting jobs for free that really doesn't give you anything. Like you're going to be paid in exposure or stuff like this. Because here, it's a very dangerous path where you're going to sell more or less your art for an equivalent of zero. And this is not very good for you, for the company, and for other artists. That said, if you know there is a benevolent independent guy that's coming, it has a very passionate project, something that you really like, and you know you can do it on your spare time, it gives you the opportunity to work out a few paintings and test stuff. You ask him, I'm allowed to put it on my portfolio, right, directly? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm sorry I can't pay you that much and stuff, then maybe it's worth it to accept. That's what I did for my first years. I worked a lot with independence. I was saying, listen, I I am not looking so much for the money, but give me the right to put it directly on my portfolio once it's finished. And generally, you know, they're happy. I'm happy. And I was training for a little money and without too much bad outcomes. And finally, all this is from old dinosaur <laughs> advice. So what I'm telling you was something for a guy 10 years ago, you know? So I don't know how much the world evolved on this part. Now I'm more on the hiring uh, step. 
And on the hiring step, the most important is always the folio. So I have a need. I go and hire the people that can fulfill my need. And I have a, you know, a grid for my salaries. And that's what's going to prevail on anything. And I can't change that. Sorry, I can't answer much better than that. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 it, it was half a thing. Thank you so much. So it's, you, you can continue your, your driving. Thank you so much. <laughs> no worries. Um, hi, <laughs> I'm Hello. Jimena. Uh, I don't have like a lot of experience with French. I can only tell you like, salut and ça va. <laughs> but... hey, it's almost anything you need in French. Huh? You can add okay. piquant and then we're good. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that sounds perfect. And I had like a couple questions. Yes. Uh, so first, you were like explaining about like processes uh, being simplified when you were talking about like the AI and things like that, about yep. UVs and oil, oil painting and like modeling processes. So I was just going to ask you like if you work in other areas, uh, uh, also as like concept artist or only in concept artist. And the other question that I have is if you have like a tip that you can give <laughs> from experience of like helping with creative block and things mm -hmm. like that when making characters or trying to get around to making a concept <laughs> or things like that. Because sometimes I think it, uh, like some tips of other people don't mix well <laughs> with how I like go through my okay. process, but I still keep on like looking for tips of everybody <laughs> so that if, if they help, I mix it in with my own. <laughs> I understand. Okay. So yeah. So uh, yes. Uh, do I work with other types of stuff, uh, 3D and everything? So I came from 3D schools. So I have, let's say the knowledge of it, but of course, I just went to the things I love the most, and it was 2D. That said, being an art director now, I am working a lot with 3D people, especially in video games. So it's important that I have at least the understanding of how they work and where they're, you know, uh, my limits are where they are useful. So I need to know my limits so I can use them as best as possible, but also not ask them stuff that are impossible. Uh, for example, I'm an art director. Um, I have my clothed character in this arm. If I take my brush and I add horns on the hand like this, for me, it's like one second and a half, right? For 3D artists, this is maybe an hour of work that I'm adding here. So all this is very important to have knowledge of, let's say, all the things that you're going to be responsible into your pipeline. It's very important. Do I use 3D in my work now? No more. Sometimes it could have happened. Uh, I still do use in some of my concepts, you know, photo bashing or uh, texture and, and stuff or paint overing, you know, in the case of Lord of Fallen, uh, I can take a screenshot of the game, paint over it to create a new piece or a new mood or a new armor. I, I'm not very attached to techniques. What's important for me is the result and how I got to this result so I can explain it correctly. And then for the second part, the how do we stop um, creative blockage? It's super hard because, first of all, it's very personal. When you're creating a piece, and not just a piece, when you're creating, that's all, when you're creating, like, you're an artist, create stuff. Um, you're always putting a bit of part of you. It can be very minimal. Like, I remember this movie, so I'm going to do something that looks like this movie. It can be, hmm, please uh, paint a unicorn for your daughter. Okay, I hate unicorns, but, you know, I have to do it. And the only image that you have is the basic unicorn that you saw everywhere. That's life. But each time you're doing this, it's going into your brain. So at some point, you're putting a bit of yourself. All this to say that more or less, everybody is different. <laughs> so it's very hard for someone to say, you know, uh, to break your, uh, your frightening of your the white canvas, you have to do uh, three push-ups and three hallelujah, and then it's going to work. 
And it's a bit of a magic that you have to find on your, on your, on your own. For myself, the things that worked for me is either to stick to the story. So I have, I have a brief and it's very, you know, driven, like you have to do this. We need to have the character to have this hair color. And then his height is one meter 73 and he has a sword, but it's not any sword. It's a broad sword. Blah, blah, blah. So I just stick point by point and I fulfill any of the points that were given to me very bluntly. And then when I watch it, usually it looks like shit and I transform. I'm a lot into transformation. So you see from, uh, it's gonna be a little pushback, this character that we are shaping, a weird, you know, I don't know, between a nun and a horrible magician, I don't know what it's gonna be. It comes from chaos. And this is one of the techniques I love the most. Putting any chaos things in front of me, and it can be like the drawing of my son here, but it could have been, you know, a few brush strokes or, uh, I don't know, a picture of a pepperoni pizza and put it on front and just see shapes and forms in it. And that's from the training of my eye. I see shapes, I see forms, and then I kind of create on top of it. One exercise I was doing when I was um, younger, like you guys, um, I was doing work by series. So I took a, 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 a character or a piece I finished a long time ago or all uh, like years ago or not even, but let's say a, long, a time ago, I opened the file, I reverse it like simple um, symmetry like this. And either I correct it or I paint over it to transform it completely. The goal being trying to have another piece that doesn't look the same. The benefit of this is that it's gonna create a character that somehow is still in the same world. So you're creating like a series. And for me that really likes inventing stories, universe, etc. It's very useful because it feels that they're coming from the same world. And at the same time, it helps you deblocking you because you're not starting with the horrible white page that is scaring all of us. You're working on something that's already fulfilled. So yeah, that's that's some of my techniques. After there is a lot of stuff, huh? I, you know, I can, sometimes I'm talking with my my kids or I'm painting on my oil canvas and like, wait a minute, but that would be great in Lords of the Fallen. And I'm just whoop, jumping up. In my computer, I add a little note on my uh, Slack channel. Remember to watch this movie tomorrow. And then, you know, things happen. I had this very recently. I We were uh, with my wife and like, oh, what are we going to look? Oh, we finished everything we wanted to book on, on Netflix. I said, let's go on Disney Plus. Let's find a movie. Uh, so we have like a chill thing. And so I go on Disney Plus. It was Halloween. And what I see, Edward Scissorhands. I'm like, oh, Edward Scissorhands. Didn't see it for a long time. I love it. So what do you think? We want to watch it again? And she says, I never watched it. <laughs> you never watched Edward Scissorhands? Well, we watch it right now. So I put the movie and we start watching. Me, I'm very sensitive to this movie. So I'm sort of crying every five seconds. But at, at the moment I'm starting to cry, I'm looking at the character of Edward, you know? So Edward Scissorhands, you know, is this guy. He lives, he's more or less like a puppet that has been transformed but the puppet is not complete and he has scissors instead of hands. And it's a Tim Burton movie. It was a very a farm style. And I watched S Edward Scissorhands and I was seeing his costume and I was like, telling to my wife, man, but if he had a huge sword in his back, he would be a badass gothic knight, no? And she was like, what the fuck are you talking about? And I jumped, I said, wait a minute. I put pose on the game. I went on my phone, added Edward Scissorhands on my Slack and said, for tomorrow, I have to do something with this. So, you know, inspiration comes from everywhere. And it's just a matter of kind of being open to it, you know, and uh, the more you get some experience, the more you're trained, your brain is trained to find experience and um, inspiration everywhere. So that's, that's I, how I deal with the terrible white, uh, white page. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really interesting. Thank you so much. I uh, I, I really like the 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 tips and <laughs> the references. So yeah, merci. Mais de rien.
So I did a little bit of design changes um, between in between the short, the short break. I went to something a bit more bold, a bit more bluesy, a bit more design focused, right? No, of course not. Let's go back to the real painting. And <laughs> that's, that's that's dad jokes, okay? And having dad jokes is very important in your career. So please apply to dad jokes. I think there were questions that were pending when we were just before we we shifted to another to the other Zoom, right? Uh, yeah, I have two questions. Uh, oh, first, you have to pay for the second one. No, I'm, I'm joking. Oh. <laughs> Have money. Go go go! Sorry. Uh, the first one is: uh, What was the biggest challenge you faced when you were making the art for Lords of the Fallen? Yeah. And my second question is: What are your main sources of inspiration when you create a concept art? Okay. So biggest challenges for Lords of the Fallen. Um, there were actually many, right? The if I I'm very like bluntly honest, one of the biggest challenges was actually UI and UX. But it's not that interesting for a concept art meeting, but it's something that's very hard, and it's always requesting a lot of thoughts and a lot of work, and um, it's so important in video games. But let's say art-wise, the most important and difficult part, I guess, was the defining the Umbral. So Umbral is like the second world in Lords of the Fallen. You have like the real world, that's Axiom, that like a uh, dark fantasy real world, very tormented, a bit horrible, inspired by Berserk, uh, all the dark fantasy tropes, very religious, a lot of uh, symbolism and stuff. And on top of that, your character has like a kind of a magical lantern that allows him to transit into a, the world of the dead that's called Umbral. And in Umbral, uh, it's a completely different setting where it's much more, let's say, cosmic horror, a bit more Lovecraftian. And it was completely to define because once you said this, that that's your brief, then you have to find a way to express this and to make it like uh, real, right? And that was the biggest challenge because we had a lot of thoughts on what it would, what it was gonna be, but making it a real imagery and how you choose the pieces and the inspiration for it and make it work. Plus, technically, it was a real big challenge. But yeah, uh, it seems that more or less, at least we did something and the proposal uh, worked. So that that was the biggest challenge, but challenge accepted and happily successful and then for inspiration for concepts or design but it goes also with art direction and stuff so me personally i'm a very strong believer of um let's say personal experience and stuff that happened and from my childhood meaning that uh i'm a kid that was uh, born in a very normal family in France, and I was um, living, you know, at the end of a dead dead end, you know, a small street. I was playing with the kids of my street. I was always inventing stories and stuff like this. Um, I was a guy that was very much fed by Dragon Ball Z, um, Sensei Caballero de Exodiaco, uh, and uh, and other stuff like this. I read. Probably almost all the Stephen Kings. I love Clive Barker. I I love horror movies, even the bad ones. And it always inspires me to find new ideas. And all this, well, I transpose it in my in my arts. So there is always a little bit of it's it's a way for me to always put a little piece of me, you know. So when you look closely to you know uh, the Dark Crusader, for example, in Lords of the Fallen. You can see that there are elements of design that's going to recall you Batman, because I was a huge Batman fan when I was a kid. Even now, I would say, but I never really changed from when I was a kid. So it, it's normal. <clears throat> and so uh, his natural enemy is going to look a bit like Joker. And actually, it, it fits, because we wanted two arch enemies fighting one, one against the other 
uh, for important stakes. And that's a bit how I work. I always try to put a bit of my myself in it. Sometimes it can go very far. For example, the game Other Side, this black and white game. And, uh, I was the art director and partially creative director on it. Um, there is a lot of me in it. The main villain is a, a child that was trapped in a cave and that created argile sculptures. And he was so sick that he became a monster. And when he became himself a monster, his creations became monsters. All this came from my personal experience when I was uh, 18 years old. I got a very weird and, uh, let's say, um, special disease, a blood disease, that um, blocked me. I couldn't move almost anymore. I was stuck in bed. If I was getting up, I had terrible pains in all my articulations. And I, I was just like... Uh, where you're 18 and you should be at the strongest part of your life. I was like a, a walking dead zombie, you know? And the thing that saved me is that actually at one point I was just, just enough better, slightly better to be put in the morning by my mother on my chair in front of my uh, paintings. And I could paint a little bit every day. So I was doing small strokes and stuff. And so I can, I can very easily say that somehow uh, art saved me uh, from, you know, insanity. <laughs> and all of this I transposed in stuff I do. Uh, this, uh, you know, dark parts and things that I was seeing when my uh, fever was so high that I was, I was so much in pain, you know, that I was imagining that it was like creatures that was like coming into my bed and nibbling me, trying to eat the part of my flesh, small and by small, you know, I, I was, as I said, I was a Stephen King fan. And this I transposed in other side, the first creatures we invented, they were called the scavengers and they were exactly this, uh, small cre crawling creatures that were coming to eat flesh. So yeah, that's how I take everything from my past, my experience, and I try to transpose it. Sometimes I take it from the experience of the others. For example, you know, uh, if you're doing a commission or you're working for a creative director uh, that has his own fears and uh, expectations, then you transpose his fears into your fears so it becomes your monsters, but also his monsters. Yeah, I hope you, uh, and, uh, I answered your question. Uh, yes, thank you so much for the answer. <laughs> My pleasure. Hello. Um, Hello. I, I just wanted to ask you a couple of things. First of all, is the it's actually a little hard to find another Cliff Barker fan that actually calls him by, you know, the <laughs> that doesn't know like just Hellraiser and, you know, the... <laughs> the product but the actual writer and i love that yeah it's it's uh for me it's one of those those authors where when i'm reading what he says i have images coming in my head so it's uh i have a resonance with what he does it's it's ex extraordinary and his yeah. art is actually very interesting too yeah yeah very very like his his paintings actually yep. this painting you're doing kind of brings me a little bit of you know oh, that's yes. a little bit of vibe of uh, terror and deformations yeah exactly um but yeah um i'm also a, a little dark dark guy <laughs> so uh my real question uh i also i'm a big fan of uh warhammer and warhammer art mm -hmm. so uh, i was wondering how did you get that kind of uh work because i that's another uh -huh. aspiration i also have so unfortunately, I'm not going to help a lot. They came to me, <laughs> unfortunately. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was, uh, it was completely out of the blue. You know, it was one of those sick dreams. What I'm saying, ah, it will never happen anyway. It's never going to happen. Yeah. And suddenly I received a message on, I think it was on Deviant Art, And uh, at this time, hey, uh, would you be available for an illustration for Warmer? I was like, Mm, bet you are of course i am <laughs> and i just came and did it i did one and that was actually one of the it was a very hard piece but i was happy you know doing it and for warmer and stuff and you know that's where destiny comes in because 
they were super happy. I was happy. And uh, I get married and I move on uh, my honeymoon and they send me another mail. Hey, uh, can you do this a second, another illustration? But we need it to be done very quickly. It's like right now and stuff. And I was, I'm sorry, I'm not available. I'm on my honeymoon. Okay. And they never came back. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that was like a quick, quick story yeah. about, uh, about, uh, uh, Warhammer. And I had something a bit similar for Magic, actually. So for Magic, they came, um, I don't remember when it was in 2020, I guess. Uh, same kind of stuff. Oh, we're doing special cards and your geometric style is is working perfectly. So, oh, perfect. So I did a set, like those uh, secret layers that are uh, exclusive sets of uh, exclusive cards for uh, for Magic the Gathering. And it was like uh, with my style, with uh, geometric forms that become characters. I was super happy. And he said, oh, it was really great. Love work with you. I was like, oh, thank you. Uh, Tom Jenkott, super, super nice guy. I was like so happy to work with Magic for this commission. I had my job. I was already an art director at this moment, but you know, I was doing it on the evenings and everything. And um, then I had my back, my second back problem where it was really getting super bad. I had to go into surgery. Uh, life was getting super hard. We were out of COVID. The, my, back, my back broke. I had two young kids. A lot of stuff were on my incredible wife uh, to, to handle the whole house. And it was really a bad time. And that's where Magic came back and said, hey, uh, we love what we did. Do you want to do a great stuff with vampires and everything? I'm like, the, the life, my life for this. But a week after, I was actually on the surgery table for my back, and I never could do the the this commission. And so that's how it ended for Magic. Up to very recently, or they suddenly, they just came back. Hey, uh, maybe you're the man of the situation. Uh, one of our directors, John Jencott, told us that you were super quick, and we need a emergency thing. Uh, yeah, let's. I can do it. I usually don't take any more commissions, but. For magic, I'll do an exception. So you know, life and always giving the best of yourself is gonna is gonna make it work. Uh, that's I think I I had this uh, advice from a video of Feng Zhu. So Feng Zhu is like a super famous concept artist. Maybe you already know it, of course, and you no know, director of a school. And I remember of one thing he said in one his one of his videos, I, and it it marked me for life. He said that. When he started, and it was his advice for any young people, he said, whatever the, the commission you receive, big, small, or Lucas looks Art, or the smallest independent, for the beginning, you always, always give the best you have. Like if it was the commission of your life. Because you, you just never know. You never know if it's not somebody who is going to grow and suddenly talk to somebody that's going to talk to somebody and somehow and in the end your folio on the desk of warmer guys and i think that's exactly what happened to me i very rarely very very rarely um applied to a job or things like this it it's more opportunities that came to me i think lord of fallen is one of the only jobs i is one of the only jobs i got and applied to and even here it was uh, like, you know, a lucky fate, fate and chance thing. So let me explain. I I was in my previous company. I wanted to kind of change, but still hesitating. You know, it's it's always difficult to do a big change and you have your family is involved, et cetera, et cetera. And one of my best friends, uh, Arthur Munoz, who is an excellent animator, one a super famous one, very, very, very good. And he know he's always receiving a lot of job offers because he's one of the best. So, you know, that's only natural. And one day he comes and says, ah, and you know, I received a thing. Uh, it was to work on Lord of the Fallen. So we, we laugh a little, oh, Lord of the Fallen. I, we don't know where there was going to be a sequel. Funny, funny. Yeah, yeah. It's this headhunter, you know, he, he just came and asked me to do animations on it. And I say, half joking, but still really joking, actually. Well, I just asked them if they have an art director position, you know. And they said, yeah. He sent a message to the, uh, 
the headhunter. And literally 30 seconds after, on LinkedIn, the guy was taking me. And then that's how it worked. So sometimes it's really, you know, a matter of luck, opportunities, and things. And also, I guess, having goals is very good, but also being happy of, you know, what you got. Because that's the way you give the best of your art. And the best of the art, that's going to bring you to the highest uh, commissions and works, I think. Yeah, I hope I answered a little to your question, even if it's it was a complicated one. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, it's at the end of the day, I've heard so much about those kind of stories, and it's as you were describing, like half good luck, half just knowing that the right people at the right time. And, yeah, exactly. And also then, you being know, ready. Oh, sorry. No, to be honest, also, uh, it's maybe the first thing I should have said, just apply. When you feel you're ready, just apply. Because sometimes, you know, that's how you provoke the good opportunity at a good time also. It's just you apply, you're at the best that you are at this moment, and sometimes it just matches. You know, the art director was going to start looking for someone, and he's like, oh, I'm not going to take 20,000 uh, resumes. Uh, this guy, he looks just super great. Let's take this one. And it works. Sometimes it happens. It just happens. Nice. Would you also say, like, is there any particular way you are the, like, you had a portfolio designed to get any particular job, like an illustration portfolio, later a concept art portfolio or something like that? Or was it just a mashup? Mm, so, on my side, I always had a mashup um first because i was i'm i was even more prolific when i was younger uh, and i was creating a lot and even if i was updating often my folio like you know i was adding new pieces and the oldest pieces i was taking them off or the one i found were were not good at one point i just stopped and then I'm adding everything in my art station. I think my art station is almost a 100% accurate of all the stuff I did since 20, 20, 2012, I guess. And I never, you know, uh, went back in it and changed and everything. It's it's almost like a blog. That said, as I said to your um, schoolmate a bit before, um, this is advices of somebody who was looking for work uh, ages ago. Now I'm in a different position and I think the rules are a bit different, <clears throat> meaning that my folio will always count. But now that I'm an art director, more and more it's you know the game that I'm releasing, the people I worked with, that's going to influence, I guess, my career. And yet I can't even say this for sure because you know I'm more or less a junior art director on this uh, standpoint. So yeah, I, I think the, the most important rule, <clears throat> how can I say this? I think there are two types of artists, okay? Uh, in the industry, more or less. You have, let's say, uh, applied artists. And applied artists are, they are, they have one style, probably that's inspired by the thing that they want to do. Like you really want to work at Blizzard. And so you concentrate and work and do in your folio Blizzard pieces that look like Blizzard, that feel like Blizzard. And so they can come and hire you because they just need someone who does Blizzard pieces, you see? And this is very valuable because it, it can be very efficient, but you need you know, to be at the right moment of them needing somebody because if you're good for Blizzard, you're probably not good for Kojima production. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and then you have another type of artist uh, that are what we, we, I could say style artists, where you develop a very strong creativity and as much as possible a unique style. And in this case, you're more unique, so you can probably get more unique jobs but for it to work, you need uh, that this particular company or particular person needs something that looks like your 
very particular style at this moment. So there is no very good solution. It's sometimes it's gonna work, sometimes it's not gonna work. And uh, the best thing is to try to be true to yourself and to how you work. For me, it would be impossible to just go and paint a Blizzard World of Warcraft style because it's just absolutely not what I am. That said, uh, my folio could have worked for any from software work somehow, or for uh, Dungeon and Dragons at the same time. You know, it's just a question of versatility and being true to yourself. Hmm. Oh, thanks. Um, actually, honestly, I'm not that young. <laughs> I oh, just wanted you know. to clarify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm. Also... These questions come from a more. Um... I'm already a concept artist and an indie studio. I do ah, freelance illustration and that kind of stuff. But it's more about like searching for that uh, alignment between my, you know, like my professional work and myself, and mm -hmm. actually trying like understand like professional transitions. Uh, I mean, if you if you really want to work with Warhammer, does your work as a concept artist currently matches those? those style or not at all uh basically not at all like so maybe, you probably yeah, so. know already what you have to do <laughs> you see yeah i've been working it. on that for a while yeah, yeah I, I mean so that that's it it's gonna be more or less this knowing that you're already let's say professional in your in your type of work there is a lot of stuff that i said here or stuff that you already know and understand so now it's probably gonna be a uh, question of relationships and applying, as I said, because you're already, you're not in the same need of a job per se, <clears throat> and you're not at the same level as a pure junior that's, you know, out of the school, uh, jumping in and probably needing to take the first job that's going to come. So um, I think you you have more or less no risks at just applying and applying of course, it's better if you're ready because jobs like um, Warhammer, depending on what you're going to be commissioned to, if you're just a freelancer work, it will be just a piece to piece and that's it. If you're trying to apply, I don't know, to the headquarter uh, in Nottingham to become you know, one of the concept artists of the third edition of uh, whatever, whatever, this is going to be a more... A longer road with more uh, testing and stuff like this so you better be prepared the other solution since you're already a professional is to try to eventually reach headhunters because headhunters they have a lot of type of works <clears throat> and sometimes they just want you know to have their uh let's say folio or uh, contacts that are uh, the, as broad as possible and then they can help you have those opportunities of suddenly being the good match at the good time. Yeah, that's that's our my small advices for you. That's very cool because actually, uh, sorry for the night. I was um actually wondering like you you mentioned very strongly about relation. You talk about very strongly about relationships, and I was wondering I was going to ask like how to. You know, be more precise when, with your relationships, as and you just mentioned, uh, headhunters. So, yeah, probably that's going to be a very good step to take next. Thank you. My pleasure. I think we're getting uh, an is uh, interesting creature right now. Huh? I don't uh, know what it is, but it is. Yeah, sorry, sorry. go, 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 go. Ah, thank you. Uh, alors, uh, très beau, très histoire. Vous nous invitez à faire de l'art ou nous inspirer de bonnes ou mauvaises expériences que nous avons vécu. Sorry, I didn't hear you. I was my my mic was off. Uh, alors, après uh, votre histoire, uh, 
Nous nous sommes bêtés à faire de l'art ou à nous inspirer de bonnes ou mauvaises expériences que nous avons vécues. Yeah, um, so good or bad experiences uh, in art, right? That's what you're asking for. So good, good, uh, good experiences in art. Actually, a lot. Uh, I was very fortunate to be in a high school of um, uh, where you concentrate a lot of people that love art and everything. So that's that's one of the best experience you can have uh, being with artists, discovering with artists and everything. That much that I actually got back uh, years after in my high school with my ex-teacher of art with the smaller classes. So, you know, I, I very, not very often talk with students like you, but actually I was talking a lot with uh, kids from, let's say, 13 to 17 years old in classes because that's where you just you know put the first premises of art and that's some of the best memories i had artistic ways of course creating a great piece having it showcased uh, or very recently on lords of the fallen seeing people fighting against some of the monsters i created Or uh, my wife and friends saying, hey, can you imagine that your character is on a huge screen on Times Square now? And like, yeah, no, I didn't imagine. Thank you for calling this. Those are, you know, great art victories. Uh, art difficult difficulties on the other side come a lot. And I think it's partially because, and we all are going to understand this here, we put a lot of ourselves, you know, in our art, right? And since we put a lot of ourselves in the art, each thing and each criticism that we take can hurt us very deeply. Uh, it can be from the smallest things to the highest and most difficult ones. For example, one of my best friends always tell me, Alex, you get 100 positive comments, but there is just one bad and you want to suicide yourself. And it's kind of true. I'm always struggling with this uh, kind of lack of confidence when I'm finishing a piece. I was like, it's good. I'm going to stop it right now. I think it's the best I can get of it. And then I post it and I'm like, I fucking hate it. I want to, I want to dry and drown myself. Please kill me now. And this, I think, is a struggle that you have from the very beginning that you're an artist to the end. <laughs> I'm going to give you one one small anecdote on how hard it can be, okay? So I was uh, in my, what we call the preparity, prep school for art schools. So it's a year very intense where you see a lot of stuff. You do a lot of traditional things. And in France, the these schools are very tough, like very, very tough emotionally, but also skill sets. And you test a lot of stuff. You start as, I really want to go in video games. And in the middle of the year, you're like, maybe I should do the Boza. I don't know anymore. So there is a lot of struggling, right? And there was this um, this moment where they did like a fake, fake exam to test yourself. So it was a very intense thing uh, where they gave you the subject. And then you were working on the subject for three days. Basically, you're not going to sleep for the three days. You deliver, you wait for a week, and then they tell you what they think. And uh, if you succeeded, you had fake interviews, etc. But if you were not succeeding, you were just left to cry. Okay. So I get the subject. I say, oh, it's cool. It's about Paris. Okay, let's go. Me, I was like a bit cringy, uh, Stephen King fan. Uh, wanted to do monsters all the time. So I painted gargoyles in uh, brown tones and everything. I fulfill my my um, folder. I do all my paintings and uh, I send them to the school and then I wait for a week. So we wait. Ta -da, ta -da. We wait, we wait, we wait. And then they say, okay, the results are here. You come in your class and you'll find your folder And they're going to say if you're accepted or not. And you'll see what's next. 
perfect, let's go. So I go in my class, I'm looking, I don't see my folder, I don't see my folder, I don't see my folder. And then I find it, Alex on the folder. I'm like, oh, cool, cool, cool. I take the folder and on the folder with all my paintings that I put hours on it, there is just a simple little note. One little note, huh? you know, those square post-it yellow notes. And on it, it's written, stop painting with your shit. And that's all. And I can tell you the shock I had as I went back to my home, so 45 minutes of subway in Paris, without saying a word, I go in my room. My parents are, are hey, how did it go? I didn't answer. I went on my bed. I stayed on my bed and I didn't move for almost two days because it was a big shock. Do I regret this shock? No, because it kind of helped me to actually, you know, stop painting only in browns for years, <laughs> but also uh, understanding that, you know, I will never be the strongest one in any fields and I can't have success all the time. Do I think it was a good way for me or any students to get into art? I don't think so too. I think that uh, it was not the most pedagogic thing to just crush people until they, you know, the, the weakest one go away and the strongest one stay, but are super aggressive about art. But yeah, it's that's that's the uh, the life of artists. We live with those uh, critiques. We live with our soul put on a plate and people saying uh, and eating it. Sometimes saying it's the best dish ever, and sometimes saying it's just pure crap. But somehow I think it's all worth it because you know we're very lucky when we can live of our art and compared to somebody that, I don't know, has to build houses and uh, take off the garbages, that they are the true heroes and we are doing just, you know, funny and silly things. But does it mean it's easy? No, it's not. I hope I answered your question. Je suis vraiment désolé que tu aies reçu de cette expérience. C'est la vie. Oui, mais c'est mauvais. <laughs> oui, c'est triste, oui. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's sad experience, but you know, it's it's also you know, life is not made to be to be happy and helpful all the time. It's made to be sometimes difficult, so you can understand the value of the times that are great. And in art, it's the same. You have you need ups and downs, or you never know when you're in up, and you never know when you're down. So I just take it like a, this kind of experience, even though I would have loved that the 18 or 19 years old me didn't have to think for uh, months afterwards that his painting was just basically poop. But yeah, that's life. That's just life. Mm. <laughs> Uh, merci beaucoup pour l'histoire. Mais de rien. Life is made of stories, so I make I like to tell stories, even sometimes it's boring, but that's that's what I am. Mm, C'est bien. <laughs> Do we have other questions, guys? Hello. Hello, Hello. Alex. I'm Andres. Uh, Alex, what do you think about uh, the actual situation of the video games companies? Because right now, in the industry, it's a little bit weird because a lot of people uh, have a layoff right now and a lot of companies change the pipelines or workflows. So I, I, I don't understand. What do you think about the actual uh, status of the video game companies around the world? Oh boy, that's a, that's a huge question. Honestly, I, I, I can just answer from my own perception. And um, me, luckily, I am not in this situation or that those terrible situations with layoffs where it's super hard and everything. 
I think it's coming from a lot of stuff. Uh, that almost maybe each case is very, you know, has common common boundaries, but each case is a bit unique. I think that the there was a lot of investments that were made in the video game industry because just you could make a lot of money if you compare it, for example, to movies or everything. The the investment is huge for triple A's, but compared to movies, it's like minimal, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people invested in video games, especially during the COVID uh, period, because there was a boom and that we didn't know how long it was going to last. And a lot of uh, pieces of the industry from Netflix to uh, video games to entertainment in general just had a lot of people coming in and injecting money. And now that actually the COVID is starting to go away or we can start to live with it, well, people understand that, hey, uh, it's funny also to go outside and not only play video games. So it was benefit beneficial for us because the video game industry you know, has been growing and growing and never stopped growing. But it's also one of the first time it started to decrease the growth because it had a boom during the COVID period. And I think that pushed a lot of people with money to just go out of the video game industry. And when they go out, it's like a ribbon effect. Those go out, then uh, companies can't schedule their time anymore. Then uh, you have to create more bandwidth of money. Then maybe the game you were doing was not getting successful and then it ends up you know to the lowest part of the pyramid and it's us and that's where we're getting layoffs and problems and everything also i think that video game industry evolved a lot a lot a lot uh not only on the let's say our side the professional side but also the perception that people have of video games that the players, and that's that's for who we are working, are getting fed up that some games are sometimes just here to cash cash them out, uh, and that's it's their right, and it's pushed also by you know influencers and everything, and at the same time, almost nobody really knows how a video company works it's something very obscure it's it's very at, we are really at the beginnings of uh youtubers or uh documentaries coming out or even being taken seriously i mean when i started even 10 years ago video games was still like uh, you know for marginalized geeks <laughs> now <laughs> I, I i think now you know my probably my kids when they'll start uh saying at school what they want to do if they say they want to work in video games nobody's gonna laugh anymore and but it was a time where you were saying you want to work in video games and people were like oh another another guy who's going to be unemployed or huh, i was sure he was a programmer you know <laughs> stuff like this <laughs> so the the world changed a lot and I think the the real thing that's gonna happen it's gonna it's gonna change again and again and again and again. The only thing is that we never know where when it's gonna stop changing and go back because everything is in a cycle, and um, this rebound effect of the COVID is a part of a mini cycle. But maybe there's gonna be a bigger one, like people saying, "Hey, uh, the guys who are working in the video game industry." It's crazy the hours they're doing, right? So they should be paid more. Okay, great. Are you ready to pay 200 euros your your video game? Nope. Well, so nothing is going to change. And that's going to be part of a cycle. One day, there are going to be some realizations that to get better game, then you have to leave the time and the creativity and uh, the marketing that everything is going to assemble together. And until then, there's always going to be accidents. And unfortunately, layoffs are, are accidents. Of course, sometimes they're also part of very bad management or terrible situations or guys that wanted to get money. And, you know, we, nev we just never know at our, at our scale. It's super hard to know. But 
the reality is just that we have to help each other uh, in those difficult days and uh, keep the faith when the most difficult things happen, I guess. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Sorry, maybe yeah. you wanted me to be revolutionary and say, hey, we have to keep it <laughs> now. But no, I, I, it's, I, it's, it's a difficult topic. And you know, since it didn't happen to me yet, I, I can't put myself in those shoes. It's, um... But but I have a question, sorry, because yeah, uh, of course. I'm pretty late. But are you working right now in a company or are you freelance? No, I am working in a company. And the company ah. is named Hexworks. That's where I'm art directing. Mm -hmm. But I always kept my um, freelance activity open. So that's that's what I how I can you know do some Magic the Gathering cards uh, awesome. on my spare time, or talk with very nice students like tonight. But okay. uh, yeah, that's 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 a part of it. Awesome. Hexworks Anything? for now is healthy, so you know we're 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 happy, and I think Lord of Fallen is selling good. So for now, we're not in those uh, difficult situations. But okay. yeah. Any tip to work with Magic the Gathering? <laughs> well, <laughs> not, honestly, as I said, it's the same story. I I am the uh, fortunate guy that kind of we we came for to to take me. I am, you know, when I was saying that they are applying artists and uh, style artists, the way I got in was with my style. But it's you know a one chance out of one thousand that it happened this way. I guess that. If you do very illustrative storytelling illustrations, you have better chances to get into Magic the Gathering than if you're doing, I don't know, abstract unicorns uh, <laughs> painted with poop. I don't know, you see what I mean? <laughs> so just put the chances on your side if it's something you really want. And uh, keep an eye on offers because I remember not that long time ago, but still, yeah, maybe a few years, a Magic the Gathering did like a huge call for artists. It was everywhere on the on the social networks and everything. They were saying, "Hey, we're going to hire a lot of guys. Send your portfolio to this, this, and this." And that's a, I think a lot of good artists got hired uh, in freelancing this way. So yeah, yeah. It's keeping stay alert and at the same time keep the faith, as we say, and uh, <laughs> maybe it'll work. Yeah, thank you so much for your advice. I'm a player. Yeah, so the easiest way is either to type my name, uh, so Alexandre Chaudray, or my um, artist's name. I'm going to write it here. So it's A Y A R T D T. <laughs> you tap this on Google, you'll find some of my stuff. I am kind of let's say, active on uh, Twitter or, uh, sorry, on X, X, uh, because, you know, I was pushed by marketing uh, of Lords of Fallen to be active on this. You can take me on LinkedIn. I take uh, anyone that's requesting on LinkedIn. So with my name. And uh, I have an Instagram where I post mostly my oil paintings and uh and um, the art station, if you want to see a lot of stuff. But yeah, I think with this, you can you can basically find me. Jort. Cool, yo. Thank you and, so much. Yeah, ah, my pleasure. And uh, I don't know when. I'll try to find some time. I'll finish this little guy, and I'll post it on the, on the social networks as well. Perfect, perfect. You can share it and we do it as well. Yep. Well, well, I guess that's all by now, as I mentioned before. 
Thank you, thank you once again for being here. It was a pleasure to talk. It was with great, you. guys. Yeah, it was really great. Super good questions. Uh, you were the best. Uh, I love you, etc. Uh, I'll say a few words in Spanish. Uh, el gato bebe leche, and um, vamos a la playa. That's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Only stuff yeah. I can. No hablo español muy bien. Yo siento, yo siento. Uh, 